You could hear me anyway, right? Yeah. Okay. For members on the committee, uh, the bill is anticipated to be introduced as well as an author's amendment on Wednesday at the session so that we're asking members to withhold questions for all the testifiers today until the end. Hopefully there'll be some time there. If you do a little math, we should have time left at the end of all the testifiers, but given the fact that people have come here to offer their testimony and given the significance of the bill, I think it's better for us to withhold our questions till the end of all the testifiers today. Does that make sense, members? With that, ladies and gentlemen, we're here to discuss Senate File 4. Thank you to everyone who's worked on this. Thank you for the engagement at the utility and stakeholder level. We're talking about climate change. We're talking about how the state of Minnesota proposes to reduce carbon emissions in the energy sector. We have invited everybody who wants to testify to offer their thoughts, both pro and con today. And the list is not in any particular order. It is simply a recognition of the committee administrator and the effort to put forward the witnesses that we think have the most things to say. The actual uh, amendment will be available very shortly to advocates who want to reach out to Justin Emmerich, the, city, the committee administrator, please do so. And from now until the moment uh, that this passes off the Senate floor, which is my hope, um, we'll continue to be engaged with stakeholders at all levels, and that includes members of both the majority and minority party. With that, I uh, would like to call the first witness forward. That would be Commissioner Grace Arnold, the Department of Commerce. Commissioner Arnold. Hey, Commissioner. Hi. Welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself and give Good. your testimony. Good afternoon, Chair Frentz and members. For the record, my name is Grace Arnold and I'm the Commissioner of the Minnesota Department of Commerce. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of Senate File 4, the 100 by percent by 2040 bill. This bill is the result of years of work here at the legislature and across the state with stakeholders, communities, workers, advocates, utilities, and others. It's been a priority since the beginning of the Walls Flanagan administration, and I'm really grateful to the chief, chief author, Chair Friends, for his leadership on this important piece of legislation. 100% by 2040 is a critical component of the Climate Action Framework. Our administration released the Minnesota Cl Climate Action Framework last September, following nearly two years of engagement with Minnesotans. Through that pr process, we heard loud and clear that Minnesotans value our clean air and water our traditions, and the future we're building for our children and grandchildren. Our climate change, change work will follow the science, confront challenges head on, and ensure everyone can benefit from the solutions. State leaders developed a framework that prioritizes bold actions, new ideas, and ensuring new voices, including tribal nations and communities disproportionately impacted by climate change, are heard. We can create a carbon neutral, resilient, and equitable future for Minnesota through the Climate Action Framework, and that starts here. Electric utilities have made significant strides in producing cleaner electricity. Investments in clean energy, energy efficiency, and energy reliability will continue to create jobs, lower energy costs, and contribute to a more stable climate. By transitioning to 100% clean energy by 2040, Minnesota utilities will lead the way to a healthier, to healthier air through significant reduction in greenhouse gases. Decarbonization of the electric power sector can uh, lead to additional greenhouse gas reductions in the transportation and thermal end uses through beneficial electrification. This bill gives utilities the planning time and flexibility that they need to reach 100% while maintaining reliable and affordable electricity for all of Minnesota. Minnesotans are powering the clean energy future through expanded job opportunities and the increasing amounts of jobs in the clean energy sector. This bill supports that workforce by prioritizing good paying jobs and growing our clean energy economy. I look forward to working with you all as this bill moves through the legislature. I think I did two minutes. Thank, thank you. you very much, Commissioner, and thank you for you and the Department of Commerce's engagement on the bill. Next, we'll call up Adam Dunnick. North Central States Regional Council of Carpenters, Mr. Dunnick, please introduce yourself and present your testimony for two minutes. Good afternoon, Chair Friends, members of the committee. My name is Adam Dunnick. I'm the Director of Government Affairs for the North Central States Regional Council of Carpenters. Thank you for the opportunity to testify this afternoon in support of Senate File 4. 
The North Central States Regional Council of Carpenters uh, works on behalf of a, la a labor, we're a labor union that represents approximately 12,000 workers and their families across Minnesota. Our members include carpenters, millwrights, floor coverers, latherers, pile drivers, and industrial workers across the state. They work on a wide array of energy infrastructure, construction, and maintenance, including fossil fuel plants, wind, solar, and nuclear. The ener energy transition won't necessarily be easy for many of our members who perform maintenance work in existing fossil fuel plants. As a union, we recognize the need to reduce carbon emissions to address climate change. And we're proud of the work our members have already done and in partnership with Minnesota Utilities, helping our state make the transition. We also believe in a technology neutral approach that allows the utilities full use of, the, of tools in their toolbox to reduce carbon emissions while continuing to provide affordable and reliable power. We're appreciative of Chair Frentz's ongoing work on his bill. His outreach and communication has been exemplary and we appreciate the opportunity to have a great amount of input in this legislation. To us, this is a jobs bill. And thanks to your work, it's a good jobs bill that will help support workers who are building a construction career. In particular, we're uh, strongly supportive of the updated prevailing wage language, which will help ensure that as we transition, workers who build and maintain our state's energy system will receive family-sustaining wages and benefits. And prevailing wages not only means a good job for workers, it also means support for our labor management and apprenticeship programs. We look forward to working in partnership with Minnesota's utilities to implement the next stage of Minnesota's energy transition. We support Senate File 4, and we encourage members of the committee to vote yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Dunnick, on behalf of the committee, and thank you to your members, too. Thanks. Folks, one of the pledges of the committee was that we would have utilities be present at the beginning, middle, and end of these negotiations and the work on Senate File 4, and our next testifier is John Brecky from Great River Energy. Mr. Brecky. Welcome to the committee again. Please introduce yourself, and we welcome your testimony. Thank you, Chair Frantz. Members of the committee, appreciate the opportunity to speak today. I'm John Brecky. I'm Vice President and Chief Power Supply Officer with Great River Energy. I want to start by saying we appreciate the author's amendments to this legislation. Even since last week, the bill has been improved to address concerns that we've raised in this process. There's still some work to do on drafting amendments, but we appreciate this work. Although this is not the legislation we would have written, the authors have listened to our concerns and engaged constructively with us on improving it. For those of you on the committee who oppose Senate File 4, we couldn't have gotten these improvements done without your position on this. The voice of opponents was critical in this process and it made for better legislation, and the result will be a credit to both sides of the aisle. Going forward, the world will be changed by the development of new energy technologies that move beyond carbon in a cost-effective manner. The timeline of that development cannot be foreseen with precision. And in the meantime, our job, and yours respectfully, is to keep the lights on. It's to keep people warm and safe. Our job is to protect people's finances. This is why electric cooperatives exist. It's why we were formed. And it's what people trust us to do. Sur survey after survey has shown that people trust their local distribution cooperatives on energy issues. Current state law sets a goal for electricity rates to be at least 5% below the national average. Let's continue to work together to position Minnesota for economic and environmental success. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Brecky, and thank you in particular for your engagement on this. Look forward to working with you. Thank you. Next, Yvonne Mangari, please come forward. Welcome to the committee. Please start by giving your name and then present your testimony. Hello, my name is Yvonne Mangari and I use she her pronouns and I'm currently an honors freshman student at the University of Minnesota. Um, my current major is nursing and I've worked with the Youth Environmental Activist Program through Climate Generation in Minneapolis for the past two years. And I'm so honored to share my journey through climate advocacy and why I support just and equitable action on the current climate crisis. I want to start out by saying that I was influenced by my best friend of 10 years to participate in climate action. And I think the movement and the people have changed my life forever. 
And of course, I could talk about how climate advocacy is important because it affects both you and me and so forth, but I think that's a given. I've learned from my many instructors, mentors, my parents, and 18 years of observations that in order to get your hopes and dreams into a reality, you need a reliable action plan. One with promise and true intentions. And passing the, Min the Minnesota 100% Clean Energy Bill is a way for all of our local energy providers to be held to a higher standard than ever before. So that becomes the new norm. The dirty emissions from fossil fuels pollute the air, water, and soil, which ends up increasing um, health problems, and especially for those that are already immunocompromised, just based on their location. Everyone deserves access to renewable energy, and this is a tangible first step. This bill being passed will not only help my own future, but it'll create a new precedent for other major cities across the United States. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Next, we'd like to invite Deb Bergen from Missouri River to come forward to testify. Ms. Bergen, welcome back to the committee. Thank you for making time. Please identify yourself and present your testimony. Yes, thank you, Senator Frentz and members of the committee. My name is Deb Bergen with Missouri River Energy Services, also known as um, MRES or MRES. Um, as you know, MRES, from my previous testimony, is a municipal power agency made up of 61 member municipal electric communities, 25 of which are here in Minnesota. And I would like to remind you that, again, that MRES and its members have moved forward on a cleaner and greener profile. MRES has wind, solar, and in 2020 brought online a new hydroelectric asset. Likewise, our membership engages in energy efficiency, community solar, and our largest member, Moorhead, Minnesota, has a community wind project. While we understand the bill's goal of 100% by 2040 and the impetus behind it, we do have concerns with the how that this bill goes about achieving that goal. Given the short time today, I'm just going to bring up one item to flag for you on this bill. Um, the bill currently removes the cap of 100 megawatts, 100 megawatt cap on hydroelectric power as it pertains to renewable energy credits and being uh, categorized as renewable in and of itself. We appreciate that removal of that cap. However, language has also been added to say that it only applies to existing hydroelectric power. That existing hydroelectric power going forward would only be the type of hydroelectric that would count as renewable or for renewable energy credits. As I mentioned before, we have done the Red Rock hydroelectric project near Pella, Iowa. That is a 43 megawatt hydroelectric facility built on an existing flood control dam. And quite frankly, there are opportunities for other small projects like that on existing dams. In fact, near Des Moines, Iowa, the Sailorville Dam is also being potentially looked at for a similar project. So as we go forward, we would like to MRES would like to continue to look at projects that we've been successful on, like the Red Rock Hydro Project, to bring forward small hydroelectric in the future um, and use these dams to their potential. And thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Bergen, and thanks for your engagement on hydro. The purpose of the bill is to reduce carbon emissions, and to the extent that hydro gets to be part of that conversation, you and Missouri River deserve credit for raising these kinds of questions. Looking forward to further work on it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, Michael Noble. Please come forward, present your testimony. Mr. Noble, welcome to the committee. Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee, uh, thank you for inviting me. I'm Michael Noble from Fresh Energy. When Minnesota set its renewable energy standard in 2007, the goal was 18 years away. Some doubted that we could achieve it. Well, not only did we achieve it, but we did it eight years earlier than required, and we did it cheaper than anyone could have imagined. The reason is that all the technologies that are star players are getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper all the time. The time has come for a 100% clean energy standard. As others have said, the climate science demands this, the economy demands this, the opportunities demand this. 
In the last decade, the cost of solar energy and storage have declined by 85%, and the cost of wind energy has declined by 55%. Solar panels has actually declined 99.75% since I graduated from college uh, some 45 years ago, 99.75% cost reduction. The Federal Inflation Reduction Act is only going to accelerate the declining costs. Almost everything we need to achieve this standard is now on sale, 30% off, for the next 10 years. We can do this. Our state's largest utilities have all committed to 100% clean energy and they're national leaders in clean energy innovation and deployment. Zero carbon sources now provide over half of Minnesota's electric supply. Our utilities make plans on decade-long horizons and they need certainty in order to plan their investments and that's why we need this bill. This standard will give our utilities the North Star. The bill is a balanced pass forward. Everyone agrees that it's important to keep affordability and reliability at the top of the list as we plan our transition. Our utilities are leaders in innovating and they're working with policymakers to solve all the challenges. Even in the past 10 days, there have been so many conversations about how to make this bill better and make it stronger and make it more workable. This bill ensures that utilities are able to continue and accelerate their investments in new technology and practices to achieve 100% carbon-free electricity without any compromise in reliability or affordability. Our utilities can definitely do this. Every time the policymakers set a goal, a goalpost for the utilities, our utilities more than achieve the goal, they exceed the goal and surpass the goal. Clean power generation is the foundation for a carbon-free economy because we have to electrify everything we can. Our cars, our trucks, our transit, our buildings, and a big fraction of heavy industry need to be electrified. So this bill, the 100% carbon-free electricity bill, is the cornerstone of Minnesota's climate program and our clean energy future that will ensure the health and well-being for Minnesotans, for the environment, and for generations to come. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for having me today. It's my pleasure, Mr. Noble, and thank you for leaning into the topics of price and reliability. I believe we'll get to some of that in greater depth on Wednesday. Thank you again for your testimony. I'd like to call forward Kevin Pranis to testify, please. Mr. Pranis, welcome to the committee. Please present your name and testimony. Uh, thank you, Chair Frentz. Uh, Kevin Pranis <clears throat> on behalf of Lyona, Minnesota, and North Dakota. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Uh, our 13,000 members, uh, 28,000 family members uh, rely, work in the energy industry, much like uh, Mr. Dunnick's members uh, across uh, everything from power generation to uh, gas utility distribution and pipeline to uh, work in refineries. So energy is critical to us. And when we look at, we've heard a lot of and reviewed a lot of 100% proposals, and we look at those proposals informed by the hands-on experience of our members who know these systems inside and out, often the math doesn't work. This 100% bill, in our view, is different. We think the math does work. It provides a realistic path for decarbonizing our electric utilities without jeopardizing affordability, reliability, and the very substantial economic benefits that the energy industry creates. Minnesota is not the first state to adopt a 100% clean electricity goal if we move forward, but we believe we'll be the first state to actually get there affordably and reliably because of the foundation we're building on and because of the smart policy that's embedded in this bill. So what's in this bill specifically? First, protections for local workers and communities that we've sought from the legislature for many years, including not only prevailing wage protections, um, but also consideration for local job impacts. It's a pretty basic concept to us. Clean energy jobs should be just as good and as available to local workers as conventional energy jobs that have supported Minnesotans for generations. We don't need to send dollars to Texas to pay for work that our folks, Minnesotans, can do here. But it's not just labor protections. This bill also allows utilities to use the full technology toolbox, not only wind, solar, and battery storage, but existing nuclear power as, and hydro, as well as emerging technology like carbon capture, clean hydrogen, biomass, 
Third, there's flexibility for the utilities and the Commission to approve the most sensible path forward for the utility, not only off-ramps for affordability and reliability, but also off-ramps for beneficial electrification. So if we can solve the climate crisis faster at 95% by electrifying more because it's more affordable, we have the option to do that. We're not going to make a mistake uh, and raise costs where it's not helpful for electrification. And finally, we wouldn't be here today if it weren't for the leadership of Minnesota's utilities who are in front of the nation in terms of moving toward these goals, as well as the federal investments mentioned by Mr. Noble, and finally, the hard work of the bill's authors, uh, committee chairs, and committee members to get to really good policy. This could have gone a lot of different directions. It could have been something that we were sort of fighting over, and instead, this is something everyone can come together and say, we can make this work, we can get ahead, and this will benefit the entire state. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Paranis, and thank you to your members as well for um, the support. Next, we'll hear from Brian Cook from Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. Mr. Cook. Welcome to the committee. Introduce yourself and present your testimony, please. Great. Thanks, Chair Friends, and members of the committee. My name is Brian Cook. I'm the Director of Energy Policy for the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. I appreciate the opportunity to express some of our concerns with Senate File 4. The Chamber, which represents over 6,300 businesses of all sizes, with over 500,000 employees, believes in a triple goal of affordable, reliable, and cleaner energy. Minnesota's utilities have made enormous strides towards providing their customers with cleaner energy. The state's energy transition has transformed our electric supply. We are already on track to be 66% carbon free within the next 12 years absent any new government mandates. At the same time, affordable and reliable energy is vital to our state's economic success. Electricity prices, which are an unavoidable input cost for businesses, are increasing rapidly. Since 2002, the average cost for large electric users has grown by 42 percent. In that same time frame, the cost in Minnesota has grown by 91 percent. In 2002, Minnesota had the 34th highest cost for large energy users. In the most recent data available from 2021, we now have the 12th highest cost. What used to be a competitive advantage for Minnesota companies has disappeared, adding to the high burden of doing business in Minnesota from a tax and regulatory standpoint. On the reliability front, the North American Electric Reliability Corporation released their long-term reliability assessment in December that MISO, which Minnesota is a member of, is at a high risk of having inadequate electricity supplies to meet demand. Wide-scale electricity outages are not an inconvenience. They pose enormous risks to the safety of Minnesotans and the ability for our economy and society to operate. With this context in mind, we are concerned that Senate File 4, as currently drafted, will put our energy triple goal out of balance. Creating this new government mandate on such an accelerated timeline will be expensive. These costs will be passed through to their customers on their utility bills, customers already facing cost increases that already outpace the rest of the nation. It will put even more stress on our already stressed grid. We do appreciate the conversations we've had with the chair and members of this committee and look forward to continuing them. As this bill keeps moving, we encourage the off-ramps in Section 4 to be better defined with objective criteria, such as the affordability goal in 216C.05 and assessments by national and regional experts to protect affordability and reliability for Minnesota's residential and business energy customers. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you very much, Mr. Cook. Thanks for your testimony. I'd like to call for Tom Dicklich, please. Mr. Dicklich, thank you for taking the time. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name, your date of birth, and then present your testimony. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, members. Uh, my name is Tom Dicklich. I'm the executive director of the Minnesota Building and Construction Trades Council. Uh, the date of birth is 12378, so thank you for that. Um, I knew it. I knew when it. When that chair asked something, you probably should answer the question. So. Um, on with testimony. The Minnesota Building Construction Trades recognize the concerns and needs for climate action. Our members see the effects of climate change daily and in fact are already working on projects that are designed to deploy clean energy technology and projects to make our infrastructure more resilient in the face of extreme weather. The women and men of the building trades around the state stand ready to do our part by utilizing our skills to do work on climate solutions. We know we, ha we, know we have skilled trades women and men to help make this clean energy transition. We have highly skilled workforce that includes not just the electricians needed, but the iron workers, laborers, operating engineers, carpenters, and millwrights that successfully can make this transition a smooth one. It will take the skills of these trades along with the boilermakers, insulators, pipe fitters, and plumbers to extend the life of our carbon-free nuclear plants and to deploy the emerging technologies such as carbon capture, geothermal, and hydrogen. We also have the skilled sheet metal workers, roofers, and glazers 
needed to install more energy efficient HVAC systems, roofing systems, and windows. The 100% clean energy bill proposed by Senator Friends and the and majority of the long would put Minnesota on track to decarbonize our electric utilities by 2040 and build a grid that delivers reliable, affordable, and carbon-free electricity that is an essential first step in any plan to decarbonize our economy. I want to specifically thank Senator Friends, House Energy Chair ACOM, and Majority Leader Long for their leadership and willingness to work with the billing trades on, the, on this issue and while doing so have strengthened our worker protections including carbon-free technologies such as large hydro, carbon capture, and renewable natural gas and also provide additional flexibility for utilities to meet carbon-free requirements. The inclusion of prevailing wage requirements for workers who build large energy facilities will ensure the women and men who keep the lights on continue to earn family supporting wages and benefits. Also adding language requiring the Public Utilities Commission to give consideration to local job impacts will help to ensure that local workers and communities will benefit from these energy investments instead of being left behind. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you very much Mr. Dicklich and thanks for building trades members for their engagement on the bill. Next, we'd like to have Isaac Orr come forward and testify, please. <coughs> Mr. Orr, welcome yeah, to the Yeah, happy birthday, committee. Tom. Oh, sorry. I'm just going to say welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and give your testimony. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, thank you for having me. My name is Isaac Orr, and I'm a policy fellow specializing in energy and environmental policy at Center of the American Experiment. I co-authored this report analyzing the reliability and cost implications of this legislation, and we found that attempting to decarbonize Minnesota's electricity sector without building new nuclear power plants would cost our state an additional $313 billion through 2050, destroy more than 79,000 jobs, and could lead to devastating rolling blackouts. Under this scenario, Minnesota families would be forced to pay an additional $1,600 per year in electric bills, that's $133 per month, and low-income households in rural areas like the one I grew up in and in urban areas will be disproportionately harmed by these rising costs, which is the opposite of environmental justice. Minnesota's regional electric grid already has a 1,200 megawatt capacity shortfall, which is enough to power half the homes in Minnesota, and this legislation would make that shortfall worse. In fact, our report found that Minnesota would experience a 55-hour blackout in January of 2040 if we experience a similar wind drought that we had in January of 2020. This legislation needs clear and measurable parachutes for costs and reliability because in committee last week or last Wednesday, the Minnesota Department of Commerce was unable to find what a reasonable rate increase was. This legislation should cap rate increases for all customers to no more than 10% by 2040, and it should have an immediate stop if a blackout occurs. Our report also found that lifting the moratorium on new nuclear power plants could achieve decarbonization for only $89 billion and maintain grid reliability. So while cannabis may get all the attention, the greenest thing you all could legalize this session would be new nuclear power plants. Thanks and have a great day. Thank you, Mr. Orr. Thanks for your testimony. Uh, next, we would ask... Will Steger, come forward, please. Mr. Steger, honored to have you in front of the committee. Please introduce yourself and present your testimony. Well, it's an honor for me, Mr. Chair, and members of the committee here to be here, and thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, my name is Will Steger, and most people know me as a polar explorer. My expeditions allowed me to witness firsthand how the climate crisis has reshaped the planet. But as important as these expeditions were in my life, and equally as important to me, is that I worked most of my life to mentor youth and to give them a voice. As a classroom teacher in Richfield in the late 60s, I taught climate change. I spent the last 50 years developing programs and founding nonprofits to educate and bring about awareness to our relationship to the environment. 20 years ago, uh, the youth started to organize and to build out the climate movement. They played key roles in our legislative victories in 2007 and 08, uh, which set the table for today's 100% energy bill. I'm not sure if the renewable electricity uh, standards or the next generation energy bill would have passed without their influence. Those young individuals who work with Governor Pliny are now in their late 30s and are again setting examples as leaders in our communities, as bus in business, as teachers, and as politicians who now represent the youth. The youth played a pivotal role in bringing about the solar revolution during our eight years of successes <clears throat> excuse me, with the Dayton administration. 
They spoke about their concerns for the climate, for their careers, <coughs> me, and future families, and for the preservations of the planet. Today's youth are vocal. They are a form formidable force. They have made it clear they stand for equity and justice, and they are demanding 100% clean energy now. This is their future. We are now on the eve of passing the 100% clean energy bill because the youth has spoken and you have listened. The bill is, is about their future. Thank you very much for welcoming me to speak today at the Minnesota State Senate. Thank you very much and thanks for your testimony. Next, we'd like to hear from Annie Levinson Falk from the Citizens Utility Board. Ms. Levinson Falk. Welcome to the committee. Please give your name and present your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. I'm Annie Levinson Falk, Executive Director of the Citizens Utility Board of Minnesota, or CUB. We're a nonprofit advocate for utility consumers in Minnesota, and I speak today in support of the bill. From CUB's perspective, this bill will ensure Minnesota's electricity system decarbonizes rapidly while protecting consumers. As many of you know, CUB is very concerned about the increase in energy costs over the last couple of years. However, costs should not be a reason to delay this bill. Wind and solar are some of the least expensive forms of energy available today. Per kilowatt hour, renewable energy is cheaper than power from coal and often cheaper than gas. Of course, the grid needs different kinds of flexibility to operate with high levels of intermittent renewables, but generally, customers benefit from the more renewable energy that can be used because of its relatively low cost. So the question is, how much intermittent power can the grid reliably handle and on what time frame? The benchmarks in this bill are certainly aggressive. CUB's confident that utilities can reach upwards of 90% clean electricity without re risking reliability or increasing costs. And in fact, ratepayers are likely to pay too much if we don't move quickly to cost-effective clean energy sources. I can't sit here today and say, though, that Minnesota can for sure get to 100% carbon-free electricity on this timeline without issues. I think that advances in technology and grid management solutions will make it possible, but that last 10% requires a bit of faith. That's why it's important to CUB that the bill maintains the off-ramp that's in law today. If it becomes too expensive or if it would compromise reliability to meet the milestones in the bill, then the standards would not be enforced. I want to thank you, Chair Friends, for bringing this important bill, and thank you to the committee for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Ms. Lepson-Falk, and thank you for um, your testimony about the off-ramps. Next, we'll hear from Kent Sulem from MMUA. Mr. Sulem, are you here? Good afternoon, Mr. Sulem. Please give your name and present your testimony. Mr. Chair and members of the committee, I'm Kent Sulem, Director of Government Relations and Senior Counsel for the Minnesota Municipal Utilities Association. I want to start by making it clear that our association and our members are not opposed to the concept of this bill, but they do have serious concerns about the ability to get to 100% by 2050. Some of the initial studies have been done show that 80% is a doable little figure, but after that, things get very murky and very expensive. Many municipal utilities only generate uh, in times of emergency or for grid stability, and yet under this bill, they would be required to have offsetting credits purchased or build somewhere uh, a renewable source that would be greatly expensive to their uh, budgets. Under the amendment that I th believe is under discussion for Wednesday, <coughs> Anybody who's not part of a power agency would have to do everything on their own, which means communities that have as few as 140 people would be forced to come up with the offsetting, would be forced to do all the reporting requirements, uh, and everything else is in this bill for very little gain. One of the things that's in this bill is diversity reporting, which is a very important issue. But we're working with, Senator, uh, with Person Richardson and the Senate author on the standalone bill for this and addressing the needs of our small communities that are not addressed in this amendment. So we just ask that uh, your door continue to be open, that we can continue to have conversations and try to find the right solution. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Suleiman. Thanks for uh, recognizing that not every utility is the same size. With that, we'd like to invite Julie Pierce from Minnesota Power to come forward, please.
Ms. Pierce, welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself and present your testimony. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair, friends, members of the committee. My name is Julie Pierce, and I'm the Vice President of Strategy and Planning for Minnesota Power. We're one of the hardworking utilities you hear about. We've had the privilege of serving a large part of Northeast Minnesota for over 115 years. With 144,000 customers, we have some of the largest industrial customers in the state, along with some of the lowest income counties in Minnesota. We take our responsibility to each very seriously every minute of every day. We need to keep the lights on. Minnesota Power is a proud, long-standing utility leader and has taken definitive action to advance a cleaner energy future in this state. Our energy supply is currently 50% renewable, and we have reduced our carbon by 50% already since 2005. We have made this progress by prioritizing reliability, safety, affordability, and benefiting all customers equitably. We recently had our next aggressive steps in our plan approved. We will be removing coal from our operations by 2035 and be 70% renewable by 2030. We're working hard. The decarbonization steps ahead are truly more complicated than two minutes allow. Uh, there's no debate that climate and carbon are widespread issues. And in the spirit of our one Minnesota, all of the states should be working together on this and stay working on this. We need to renew and create a constructive environment with our Public Utilities Commission, our agencies on navigating the costs, permitting and implementing challenges that are ahead. We need healthy companies to get this goal done. We appreciate the terrific work, Chair Friends, and others that have done work on this bill and recognize the challenge ahead. The bill provides a number of tools that will help us manage an acceleration of our transition because we cannot get this next phase wrong and it needs to work for all citizens of Minnesota. We look forward to continuing this progress with you and uh, on our 100% carbon free vision. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Pearson. Thanks for your advocacy on behalf of large industrial customers. We're all in it together. With that, the committee would like to welcome Priya Shea from Excel. Ms. Shea, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and present your testimony. Great, thanks for having me. Thank you, Chair, friends, committee members. I'm Bria Shea. I'm the Regional Vice President of Excel Energy Regulatory Policy. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to provide supportive comments today. Minnesota has shown great leadership on renewable and carbon-free energy. Our customers benefit from the constructive regulatory environment, allowing us to lead the clean energy transition and to do so affordably. At Excel Energy, we set a nation-leading vision to achieve 100% carbon-free energy affordably and reliably by 2050. Your bill encourages us to go faster, which we find exciting, but also challenging. To meet the challenge, we want to quickly move forward, working with labor and trades to build the projects already approved in our resource plan, including the state's largest solar project in Becker. We will also need to embrace new technologies. We'll need to be efficient. We will need to tackle more at once. <clears throat> Fortunately, Minnesota is well positioned to take advantage of the IIJA and the IRA. We all take reliability and affordability seriously, so we appreciate the review process for the commission to reassess progress and adjust as necessary. We plan an integrated system that covers and works with policymakers in five states. It's vetted through a robust and thorough resource planning process. As you know, the commission approved our recent plan, which provides for the addition of significant wind and solar, the closing of our four remaining coal plants by 2030, and the expansion of significant demand customer demand response programs and the extension of our Monticello nuclear plant, among many other issues. We expect to address the extension of our Prairie Island nuclear plant in our next plan filed next year. We will move from 60% carbon-free energy today to 80 to 85% carbon-free by 2030, while ensuring we maintain affordability and reliability for our customers and responsibly transitioning our host communities and our employees. Though some gas generation is necessary during the transition, we increasingly view those units as insurance policy units. We are committed to working with our partners and policymakers as we continue our leadership in bringing carbon-free energy to our customers. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Shea, and thank you in particular for Excel's engagement on the bill and on the issues. With that, I'd like to invite Aurora Boutron to the testifier's table, please. Welcome back to the committee. Please introduce yourself and provide your testimony. 
my name is Aurora Vatran, and I'm the Legislative and Political Director for the Minnesota 100% Campaign. Um, thank you, Chair Frentz and members of the committee for the opportunity to testify today. Um, I also want to recognize Chair Frentz um, and some of our co-authors who also sit on this committee for the work that they have done on this bill, uh, which, if passed, would be the single biggest action our state has taken to address the climate crisis. The Minnesota 100% campaign is a cross-sector, statewide, multiracial, intersectional campaign to build an equitable, clean energy future for everyone in Minnesota. We have almost 60 organizational endorsers to date who have come together because we believe that all Minnesotans, regardless of their race, gender, income, status, and zip code, deserve 100% clean energy. Our coalition has had thousands of conversations with people across the state and we can tell you that they have made loud and clear that they unequivocally support 100% clean and renewable energy. To protect the places we love, to address our changing climate, to lower our electricity bills, to lessen asthma and cardiovascular disease, and for many other reasons, Minnesotan support for 100% has and continues to be strong and durable. The action you take today is bigger than this bill, it's bigger than this hearing. It's a moment that will signal how the state of Minnesota chooses to act or not on the climate crisis we face. This is a historic moment, and I ask you, committee members, to meet it by supporting the 100% clean energy bill. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Bautron. Thanks for your work on the bill. Next, we'd like to invite Madeline Samarillo from Clean Grid Alliance to come forward and testify. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and give your testimony. Hello, Chair Friends and members of the committee. My name is Madeline Smarillo. I'm a senior policy associate with Clean Grid Alliance, and I appreciate the opportunity to testify. CGA, or Clean Grid Alliance, is a nonprofit organization headquartered and working in Minnesota, plus eight additional states in the Midwest. Our membership consists of wind and solar developers, manufacturers, and nonprofit clean energy advocacy organizations. CGA is well known for its technical and policy expertise and ability to bring diverse groups together to advance opportunities for renewable energy development development throughout the region. CGA supports Senate File 4 and its effort to create a 100% carbon-free standard by 2040, but recognizes that citing reforms are necessary to achieve this goal. I'd like to draw your attention to the common sense citing reforms included in the bill, what we call clean energy deployment provisions. Senate File 4 eliminates the certificate of need requirement for independent power producer wind and solar projects to better reflect Minnesota's changing energy landscape. The bill also reforms and streamlines the permitting process by changing certain requirements for low voltage transmission lines. And it improves the environmental review process by removing unnecessary red tape. Clean energy deployment provisions expedite the permitting process to help us meet our carbon reduction goals, making them an essential part of good clean energy policy. More information on these aspects of the bill is available in your packets, and I encourage you to reach out to CGA with any questions. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify. Thank you very much, Ms. Merlo. Um, next, we will ask Spencer Polk to come forward. Mr. Polk, thank you for joining the committee. Welcome you, to the Chair. Senate, and if you could please introduce yourself and give your testimony. Yes, thank you, Chair. Thank you, committee members. Thank you for your attention, for this opportunity, and for this bill. I'm 24 years old. I've worked for a fossil gas utility. I am a certified photovoltaic professional, and have marched with thousands of youth climate activists in Berlin. I sp spent my life trying to understand our grief the grief of farmers I know losing crops from climate change impacts, the loss of our northern forests, the loon, and the loss of my happiest place on earth, uh, a frozen pond with hockey skates. In the past 50 years, Minnesota lakes have lost half a month of ice time. In car if carbon emissions are not reduced, Minnesota will have the same climate as Kansas by 2080. We will lose what we know to be Minnesota, this is my future. I'm here representing young people and the majority of Minnesotans in support of SF4 to protect our common home. Minnesotans are stepping up to create a better future, but those who profit from fossil fuels are seeking to protect their position at our expense. We can come together to take action to heal our climate, 
we can enjoy locally made energy and jobs that protect our common home. We can lead in the new energy future with innovations that fuel a cleaner, safer, and better world. We can create the home we need. I support SF4 and I'm asking you to support my future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Polk, for your testimony. Next, we'd like to invite Joe Hoppy from Otter Tail. Mr. Hoppy, welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Please introduce yourself and testify away. Will do, thank you. Mr. Chair and members, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Joe Hoppy, and I'm the manager of legislative affairs for Otter Tail Power Company. My comments today include highlights from uh, the written testimony that you've received. Otter Till is one of the smallest investor-owned utilities in the nation. Our service area is very rural. A median-sized community we serve is Winger, Minnesota, with a population of 174 people and a medium household income of $38,500. Otter Till Power is on a course that will have us generating 50% of our owned and contracted resources from renewables by 2025. Likewise, we are on track to reduce carbon emissions from generation, re generation resources we own approximately 50% by 2025 and 97% by 2050. However, we do have concerns with the legislation. It is prudent to exercise caution in imposing mandates. The pace of the generation fleet transition must be affordable for our customers in towns like Winger, and it must not generate, it must not jeopardize reliability. The Mid-Continent Independent System Operator, MISO, continues to heighten public awareness on its increasing reliance on emergency protocols and declining reserve margins and fewer dispatchable resources due to continuing retirements of thermal units. We appreciate that this legislation affords the ability to use renewable energy credits, or RECs, for compliance purposes, and we appreciate the author's willingness to add some clarification to the language. Certainly, we understand policymakers' desire, desire to address climate change, but our primary message is that this work should occur deliberately and with a laser focus on affordability and reliability. The public deserves no less. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Mr. Hoppy, and thank you for your engagement on the bill, too. Next, we'd like to invite Bree Halverson forward to testify. Ms. Halverson. Welcome to the committee. Welcome. Please identify yourself and give your testimony. Thank you very much, uh, Chair, friends, and committee. Uh, my name is Bree Halverson. I'm the Midwest uh, States Director for the Blue Green Alliance, which is a national partner of labor unions and environmental organizations uh, that was started right here in Minnesota. So I'm here today to testify in support of uh, Senate File 4, specifically the labor and equity provisions in it. And we thank the authors for all their work and this committee for their work as this bill progresses. Minnesota was a true leader in the race to grow clean energy in the Midwest in 2007. We were in the forefront of a movement to grow renewable energy in our state. And today there's an estimated 57,000 jobs in clean energy, energy efficiency and advanced transportation and other clean uh, sectors in our state. Um, Minnesota has progressed at a little bit of a slower rate and it's time for us to uh, have a 100% clean energy law in our state tied to labor and equity standards. The Blue Green Alliance in Minnesota believes that a powerful workforce and equity standards in this bill are needed to ensure that the jobs we create are local, good paying, safe union jobs that are available to all Minnesotans. The clean energy economy should be built by union workers. Already union workers around the state are making buildings more efficient, constructing wind turbines and more. With the standards in this bill, these good paying, safe and equitable jobs will continue to grow. Unions matter. Our nation uh, has been struggling with economic inequality for decades. The U.S. Census Bureau reported that income inequality in 2018, um, the gap between the wealthiest Americans and the average worker has reached the highest level recorded since the Bureau started tracking the gap. According to the Economic Policy Institute, CEOs in 2020 were paid over 350 times more than the typical worker. This is also a problem facing Minnesotans. The income inequality gap here is significant, particularly for people of color who are 300% more likely to be in poverty than white people. 
There is a direct correlation between the increase in income inequality and the decrease in worker power, as a share of workers and unions fell from 24% in 1979 to now under 11%. The investments we make today, growing the clean energy, making our homes and buildings more efficient, and investing in our manufacturing sector to build what we need for a clean future here can grow good paying jobs workers need to do more than just get by. I wanted to highlight a few things, but my uh, fellow uh, uh, members from the carpenters and um, laborers and the building trades uh, went through all the provisions uh, wonderfully. And I just wanted to say that these provisions will make sure that we are installing ut utility scale solar with well-trained local labor, expanding the number of local wind jobs, and building technology for the future like geothermal here in Minnesota with union labor. We urge you to keep these provisions strong in the bill and move it forward to ensure that we build a clean, thriving, equitable future. Thank you for your time today, and thank you for your work on this bill. Thank you, Ms. Halverson. Next, we'd like to invite Greg Mast forward to testify. Mr. Mast. Welcome to, back to the committee. Nice to see you again. Please give your name and present your testimony. Good afternoon, Chair Friends and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Greg Mass, and I am the Executive Director of Clean Energy Economy in Minnesota. We are an industry-led, nonpartisan, nonprofit organization representing the business voice for clean energy here in Minnesota. Today, I'm here to testify in support of Senate File 4, which will significantly strengthen our state's clean energy businesses through policy leadership. Our organization is proud to support Senate File 4 for three reasons. First, it means business opportunity. This bill provides a clear commitment that positions Minnesota as a leader in the transition towards a net zero economy. Through continued collaboration and partnership alongside of our utilities, this will unleash significant job creation, spur business model innovation, and expand investment across our state. Second, this legislation strengthens Minnesota's energy independence and security. In a recent statewide survey conducted by our organization, 85% of voters agreed that we should accelerate the growth of clean energy so that we can produce more of our own electricity in Minnesota and rely less on importing from other states and countries. Furthering the transition to low cost and local renewable resources will reduce our dependence on energy imports while keeping energy dollars and economic benefits in Minnesota. And third, Senate File 4 mitigates risk. Our companies know that climate risk is business risk. Delivering policy certainty to fully decarbonize our state's power sector enhances the ability for businesses to achieve their own internal clean energy and climate goals while also helping them meet the increased demands from investors, customers, employees, and stakeholders who expect sustainable operations. In closing, Minnesota has already successfully demonstrated that we're up to the challenge of decarbonizing our power sector and delivering economic benefits. As you've heard, in 2017, Minnesota achieved its goal of reaching 25% renewable energy generation a full eight years ahead of schedule. By 2021, 52% of electricity generation in Minnesota was from zero carbon energy sources. And today, nearly 58,000 Minnesotans work in good paying clean energy jobs with nearly 40% of those jobs located in greater Minnesota. SEAM urges your support of Senate File 4 and this extraordinary economic opportunity for Minnesota. We thank Chair Frentz for his leadership and for bringing this bill forward and look forward to working with all of you to ensure that Minnesota leads towards an equitable, inclusive, and prosperous clean energy future. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you, Mr. Masson. Thanks for your repeated engagement on the topic for our businesses. Next, we'd like to invite up Sarah Radian to testify. Welcome to the committee. Please uh, start by giving your name and then present your testimony. Thank you, Chair Friends, committee members. My name is Sarah Meridian, and I'm the Government Relations and Policy Director for CURE, which stands for Clean Up the River Environment. Uh, thank you for the chance to testify in support of Senate File 4 today. As a rural organization dedicated to uplifting rural voices and strengthening rural communities, we are excited by the possibilities that Senate File 4 presents. We know that solar, wind, batteries, and a modernized grid will allow rural communities to strengthen the resilience and reliability of their energy systems and ensure affordable electricity while providing clean air, water, and soil. Senate File 4 would ensure that all Minnesotans can realize the benefits of these clean energy solutions. 
Still, Senate File 4 is not perfect, and we must think critically about whether a proposed solution will preserve the health and safety of our communities while ensuring quantifiable, long-term, greenhouse gas emissions reductions. For example, large hydro, such as that produced by Manitoba Hydro and sold by Minnesota Power to its customers, has had devastating impacts on indigenous peoples, displacing communities and disrupting ecosystems. And while we are pleased to see the limits put on the use of incinerators as an eligible energy technology, recognizing the burden this has placed on the community of North Minneapolis, we're concerned that Senate File 4 still reflects Minnesota's anachronistic reliance on burning waste, despite the harms it causes to a community's air, water, and land. Finally, the broad definition of carbon-free could encourage adoption of technologies like carbon capture, utilization and sequestration, and nuclear, which present their own significant issues around cost, viability, safety, and environmental justice. The clean energy future is here, and the people of greater Minnesota deserve the economic and environmental benefits that Senate File 4 would provide just as much and just as urgently as Minnesotans in the metro areas. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Rady, and well done. Next, we'd like to invite Adam Trombley up from Nobles Electric Cooperative. Unless he's not here, and then he will not testify. Um, then let's go to Ellen Anderson, please, from MCEA. Ms. Anderson, welcome to the committee. Thank you so much, Chair Friends, and for the opportunity to uh, testify today. We really appreciate it. My name is Ellen Anderson, and I'm here on behalf of the Minnesota Center for Environmental Advocacy and our many supporters across the state of Minnesota. Um, I served in the Senate for 18 years and passed many of our clean energy laws. And the debate around this bill reminds me of where we have come from and where we are going. When we've first proposed the first renewable energy standard in 2001, energy engineers testified that the electric grid could only handle up to one or two percent renewable energy. We gradually passed legislation for one percent, then seven percent renewable energy, but we were always told it wasn't technically possible or affordable to do more renewable energy. To their credit, the utilities did comply with these, and the sky didn't fall, and the grid didn't crash. Finally, in 2007, we passed the 25% by 2025 renewable energy standard with a nearly unanimous and bipartisan vote. The result was that the renewable energy standard saved billions of dollars for Minnesota, not to mention environmental and health savings, and we met the targets eight years ahead of schedule, as has been mentioned. There were off-ramps in that law, like there are in this bill, and no utilities ever used them. In fact, utilities, grid operators, and renewable energy producers have become experts in integrating renewables into the grid, maintaining reliability, and cutting costs. And the electricity sector has cut emissions significantly more than any other sector in Minnesota. So we've also learned through this that policies that set clear, reasonable, stepped targets make it possible for utilities and others to plan and adapt to the future. So you may have heard today that we are going too fast, when in fact we are moving far too slowly to meet the climate imperative. Minnesota citizens want action now towards a clean, carbon-free future to protect our land, air, and water, and our next generations. And we must especially protect communities that bear the brunt of fossil fuel pollution. So in conclusion, we have the know-how, and we, we have proven that we can achieve powerful and ambitious goals and continue to lead the Midwest to a clean energy future for all. We ask you to vote yes for Senate File 4. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. I wrote down, sky did not fall. <laughs> Next, we'd like to invite Justin Johns up from East Central Electric. Am I pronouncing that right? It's German, you got it right. Mr. Johns, thank you for that. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and present your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Good afternoon, Senators. My name is Justin Johns, and I'm the President and CEO of East Central Energy, and I'm grateful to talk with you today about this historic legislative effort. East Central Energy is a distribution cooperative serving 64,000 homes and businesses. I'm here today on behalf of the Minnesota Rural Electric Association, an association that represents East Central along with 43 other electric distribution cooperatives and six generation and transmission utilities 
collectively serving 1.7 million Minnesotans, one third of the state's population, and a full 85% of its geography. While we still have important reliability and affordability concerns with this bill, we are not here opposing the bill today. Our position today reflects our appreciation for the meaningful changes being made, and just as importantly, our understanding and expectation that policymakers and regulators will work collaboratively with us in good faith going forward to fully protect the reliability and affordability of the essential service we provide to those 1.7 million Minnesotans. When the bill was first introduced, we felt the state's cooperative voices were not being heard. Today, I'd like to thank those of you who made sure our voices were heard. And there is no doubt in my mind that Minnesota will be better off as a result. As we continue to move forward with decarbonizing the grid, let's come together around long-term policies that are rooted in practical problem solving, policies driven by technology and incentives and opportunity instead of mandates. We can be bold, but we also have to be deliberate and practical. We can decarbonize the grid, but we can't compromise on reliability or affordability along the way. In closing, I want to thank this committee for the opportunity to address you today and for the continued dialogue on the important future of energy in Minnesota. I'd like to thank Representative Long for his willingness to make changes to the bill. I'd like to thank Chair Friends, Senator Hoffman, and others, including the Republican members of this committee and of the House Committee, for helping to ensure that rural cooperative voices were heard and for their focus on the well-being of our membership. Minnesota municipal cooperative and investor-owned utilities are leading the country in so many ways. Let's not lose the collaborative nature that has taken us so far towards achieving our common goals to ensure safe, reliable, affordable, and increasingly clean energy for all Minnesotans. Thank you. Mr. Johns, thank you. Well done. And thank you to MREA for the engagement. Uh, I'm a proud member of Benko Electric. Um, um, and I, um, on behalf of those that live in greater Minnesota, we have to have all voices at the table. We have to have participation and engagement. Or what we're doing here is not going to be as successful or as durable. Thank you, Mr. Johns. With that, we'd like to invite Mike Manzel forward to testify. Thank you, committee chair. And, uh, Welcome members. to the committee. Um, for the record, it's uh, M-E-N-Z-E-L, date of birth 429, uh, never mind. <laughs> um, Health Professionals for Healthy Climate supports uh, Senate File 4. Um, and I believe that this uh, bill is a testimony to the ingenuity and hard work of all the utilities in Minnesota. And I know they can do it. Um, HPHC um, works for a healthy climate to protect uh, public health, and globally we are facing a climate emergency that increasingly puts our health in jeopardy. Climate effects such as extreme heat, um, severe storms and flooding, wildfires, drought, and vector-borne illnesses are increasingly impacting the physical and mental health of Minnesotans. Despite our best efforts at mitigation, Mother Nature always has the last word. Climate change is also increasing our exposure to air pollution. Earlier this month, the MPCA issued several days of, of uh, uh, an, an air quality alert, threatening persons with asthma, allergies, and heart disease. This was a direct result of particulates and noxious gases uh, from fossil fuels, primarily. Minnesota communities with higher percentages of lower income people, people of color, indigenous people are exposed to higher levels of air pollution from all sources. The public health benefits of clean energy are substantial. Moving to carbon free energy could save Minnesota more than $1.2 billion in avoided health care costs between 2023 and 2040 by reducing pollution from power plants. Um, I would say that um, um, it's even a better bargain, this bill is even a better bargain if we were to take into account the extraordinary costs to health and infrastructure due to climate change. In addition to improving health, a transition to clean energy will benefit BIPOC and low-income families by providing a pathway to well-paying green jobs and reducing energy costs. Moving to 100 percent um, by 2040 will accelerate Minnesota's path 
to our healthy net zero future by 2050. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Menzel. Appreciate your testimony. Now we'd like to invite uh, Reverend Christian Brionis to come forward and testify, please. Good afternoon, Reverend. Good well, afternoon. Welcome to the committee. Please Thank introduce you. yourself and present your testimony. Thank you. I'm the Reverend Christian Briones. I'm a minister at Mayflower Church in Minneapolis. My colleague Sarah Campbell was unable to be here because of jury duty, but I'm speaking her words today. Firstly, I want to thank you all for your care and for your public service for Minnesota, the people, and for the land, and for the animals of the earth. Clergy on the front lines of the mental health crisis of our children, youth, and young adults. We care for them, we visit them hospitalized for their mental health, and we officiate their funerals when a young person completes suicide. Please hear me when I say our children are suffering greatly from, the climate, change, from climate change despair. The planet is very ill, but it's not yet time for hospice. And the fact that we have everything we need to address this planetary crisis, solar, wind, and more, and these sources of energy are even cheaper than fossil fuels, it makes all the more bewildering and confusing for generations that come behind us. That we can remedy this situation, but we don't, they must wonder how much we really love them. Our children will, will begin to feel hope again when they see us doing everything possible to rise to the challenge. We all felt such hope at our community at Mayflower when we were doing the work 10 years ago, raising the money and installing 200 solar panel, panels and ins insulating the building. Such a great hope. We are feeling hope now in the state of Minnesota and that we can be leaders in the clean energy revolution in our country. Move over deniers, move over doomers. God has given humanity power to rise to the great challenges in the past, and we can do this again. For the generations behind us, our children are watching. Thank you. Thank you very much, Reverend. Now we'd like to invite Michaela Freeman from Youth Program and Outreach at Minnesota Interfaith Power and Light. Hello. Ms. Freeman, welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself and present your testimony. Hello, my name sorry, is Michaela Freeman. I am 19 years old and I am a pre-social work major at MCTC. I have several jobs surrounding environmental justice and one of them is as a Youth Empower uh, Program and Outreach Coordinator at MNIPL. So today I'm here to speak about, or to speak in support for the 100% bill. We need 100% clean electricity as fast as possible for our future, but also for right now. When our electricity isn't clean, it makes our city dirty and our air as well which is why I particularly appreciate the change this bill makes regarding incineration, making sure that large trash burning facilities in highly populated places are not considered renewable. The youth I work with talk a lot about trash incineration because many of them live near the HERC, uh, the state's largest trash burner. It is crucial for them to know about it since it affects them and their families and their health. The HERC affects the people around it every day. Those neighborhoods are where many black, indigenous, people of color, as well as many uh, people who have lower incomes live, myself included. For these communities like North Minneapolis, already next to the highway, adding the incinerator on top of it was another injustice placed intentionally in this community 30 years ago, even though the people who live there protested. I've lived in North Minneapolis for over 10 years. It is my home and I want to fight for it. I am one of the many people in these neighborhoods that has respiratory issues and needs to always be sure to have my inhaler and check the, the air quality. Being in the heart of the city, you don't just feel it and breathe it. When you drive by the Hurricane incinerator, you see the smoke pollution. It's not water vapor, it's polluting our air. But people are told this incineration is renewable energy. Actual renewable energy powering our lives would be very beneficial. That is what we need to work towards, and this bill takes big and small steps in that right direction. In closing, I'd like to emphasize that our present and future climate is something that the youth and I work with every day worry about. Many times, uh, in talking with adults, we have heard them say our generation 
has really harmed the earth and now it's up to your generation to fix it. And I feel like this is a very inappropriate burden and irresponsible reaction. When we see that we're doing something harmful, it is important or it is imperative on all of us of any age to stop doing it to find a better way. This is why I want to thank you all for um, bringing this bill forward and this committee for your work. I ask you to support the 100% bill. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Freeman, and thanks for giving a voice to your generation. With that, we'd like to invite Miranda Gohn from Meeker County. Ms. Gohn? All right. We can jump ahead then to David May. Mr. May, are you here? Mr. May, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself you. and give your testimony. My name is David May. I'm a retired utility worker, lifelong, 40 years with expertise in power production and system operation. And I'm here to inject a note of caution to this committee. Thank you to this committee for inviting me to uh, testify. In Minnesota, extreme weather is the norm rather than the exception. This body is trying to decide whether to take steps which will have profound implications on how we cope under the harshest of these conditions. Are you ready to explain your actions to the citizens of Minnesota when MISO declares an electrical system capacity shortage is compelled to initiate rolling blackouts to protect the grid from collapse? MISO has already declared a capacity warning without additional asset retirements. Are we not listening? I offer us a solution, an insurance policy, if you will. Let's require of Excel Energy and Minnesota Power that when major generation assets are retired under existing plans, that they must mothball them. Mothball them so that they can be restarted within 30 days at the direction of MISO, who has determined that our resource planning has not lived up to expectations and that there is no longer sufficient capacity reserves. Germany wisely did this and has successfully restarted many of those preserved assets. This gives the legislature an off-ramp instead of no place to go should this become a reality. Going forward with a let's see how it goes approach instead of a Hail Mary one would make folks like me sleep better at night. In summary, we are not ready to abandon fossil fuels in our quest to be 100% carbon free in our fuel mix. Look at the attached MISO fuel mix graphic and ask yourselves, are we ready to abandon the 93% of required fossil and nuclear assets that was required on February 15, 2021? You should have copies of that in front of you. If you have questions, please contact me. My contact information is on there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. May. Thanks for your testimony and for your work. With that, we'd like to invite Dr. Don Wheeler to testify. Dr. Wheeler. Welcome to the committee. Hi. Please introduce <laughs> yourself and present your testimony. Thank you for allowing me to uh, speak. I'm Dr. Don Wheeler. I have, uh, um, uh, I'm here, I have 34 years of experience as practicing internal medicine in um, various parts of the Twin Cities, um, as, as well as being an assistant professor at the university. Um, I'd like to speak um, a little, in more, a little more detail about some of the health effects of climate change. A lot of these we're seeing already, a lot, and, and hopefully bills such as a 100% clean energy bill will help mitigate some of these effects. The most obvious health, health consequence of, of, of climate change is the increased frequency of severe weather events, which I think we've all witnessed. Um, in particular for Minnesota, this would be heavy floods, heavy rains and, and result in heavy floods, and obviously resulting in direct injury as well as um, um, to, to, to people, as well as the probably poor sanitation related to uh, that in the areas that are flooded. Um, a more consequence probably are the increased frequency of heat 
heat waves. Um, the, the years that, that these happen, um, for, um, for in 2018, which was particularly warm, there was about 19,000 increased uh, U.S. deaths uh, attributed to that. And globally, uh, the n number of deaths, mortality related to heat waves has risen 50% just in the last uh, 20 years. Um, people that have underlying uh, heart and lung disease are particularly susceptible to the heat waves. Um, people obviously without air conditioning, um, and then elderly people as well as people on certain medications. Um, and finally, the, more, the most obvious part of climate change is increase in air pollution. Um, uh, fossil fuel, fuels obviously contribute to this with particulate matter, but um, increased temperature per se um, causes more um, uh, development of ground level ozone. Uh, ozone is uh, particularly toxic to lungs um, and exacerbates people with lung disease. Um, in addition, the longer growing season uh, allows pollen to be around longer and more, uh, more problems with uh, a, a, what they call aero al allergens, which for exacerbating a asthma. And finally, with drought, um, either here or in, um, um, uh, in other parts of the, and drought and subsequent wildfires, um, either here or in other parts of the country, we've seen um, the increased particulate matter that comes into the air and causing exacerbation of lung disease. Um, so in conclusion, I think that there are, are plenty of, of uh, health consequences of climate change and, and they will be only get worse um, unless we start to turn things around with bills such as this. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Doctor. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we'd like to invite Eric Meyer and Philip Holt forward to testify, please. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Well, uh, welcome to both of you to the committee. Please introduce yourselves, uh, whoever wants to go first, and present your testimony. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Friends, members of the committee. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify. Uh, my name is Eric Meyer. I'm the founder and executive director of Generation Atomic, a pro-nuclear environmental organization based in Minnesota, uh, but active around the country and internationally. Uh, this is uh, one of our volunteers, uh, Philip Holt, who leads our, our government team. Um, I'm also a, a member of the city council in Falcon Heights, where I serve on their environment commission. Uh, so this uh, past summer, our organization had a booth at the Eco Pavilion at the State Fair where we spoke to over a thousand Minnesotans on Labor Day and time and time again people were shocked to hear that the majority of Minnesota's clean electricity comes from our two nuclear power plants, uh, Prairie Island and Monticello. Uh, inevitably they would ask why we don't have any more nuclear plants and they were again, to, they were again shocked to find out that it is illegal to build nuclear plants in the state of Minnesota. Um, today, our state still produces about 27% of our electricity with coal, uh, much of that scheduled to come offline in the next uh, decade or so, but what will replace it and meet the demand expected to double with new electric vehicles and electric heating coming into homes, and what will happen to the communities that are supported by this fossil generation today? Uh, that's what we're, we're trying to figure out here with, SF, uh, with this SF4, right? Um, well, uh, if we try to replace those jobs with wind and solar, uh, in our opinion, um, uh, we may see a, a bit of a decline in standards of living in those energy communities uh, as uh, coal plants pay about $34 an hour on average, according to national uh, wage reports, and uh, solar and wind, it's about $24 and $26 an hour. Uh, a nuclear job, that's 42 bucks an hour. So that's about 50,000 a year for renewable jobs, 70,000 a year for coal, and about 85,000 uh, for nuclear annual salary. So something to keep in mind. And I think if we, if we try to legislate better jobs uh, for wind and solar, uh, then the cost of power will likely go up and that burden will be felt by ratepayers. Um, the good news is uh, this future doesn't have to be illegal in our state and it might actually be easier to transition uh, than we think. The Department of Energy certainly seems to think so. They recently released a study showing that over 80% of our existing coal facilities could be economically transitioned over to a nuclear plant. Um, so, you know, F SF4 
provides a great blueprint for getting to 2040, but at that point when we have to replace three reliable 24-7 low carbon sources, I think utilities and members of the Public Utilities Commission will find that their hands are tied with the options that they have available to them. Um, and lifting the nuclear moratorium, I think, is a simple action that doesn't mean we're going to be building nuclear plants in Minnesota you know, anytime soon, but it will give Excel and other utilities the ability to engage with developers and more closely evaluate the feasibility and potential benefits of replacing Minnesota's fossil generation with new nuclear like they're looking at doing in Wyoming and several other states like Wisconsin. Uh, so for our workers, you know, let's give our utilities the ability to fully assess all of our options going forward and take a look at lifting the nuclear moratorium. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time. Thank you both very much. Uh, looking forward to further discussion. With that, we'd like to invite Pete Waginius to come forward and testify. Mr. Waginius. Welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself and pre present your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm Peter Waginius, Legislative Director of Sierra Club. The public is demanding action on the climate crisis, and we cannot miss this opportunity. There's many ideas to address the climate crisis, some big, some small, some real, and some fake. The bill before you is big, and it is real. As you review ideas, please remember the two biggest climate bills were already passed by the House two years ago when the Senate refused to hear them. Omnibus energy, including 100%, and omnibus transportation, including ongoing revenue for transit statewide. These two bills remain Sierra Club's top priorities. Some sectors, like electricity and surface transportation, are faster to decarbonize than others, like heavy industry or aviation, because the key technologies we need, solar, wind, energy storage, already exist, and the costs continue to fall dramatically. Thank you for your work. One other specific thank you. Burning garbage should not be considered renewable the same as solar and wind, so we appreciate that the largest burner in Hennepin County is not. We have a history of disproportionately putting pollution in black and brown neighborhoods. So that provision is a step towards justice. Also, large hydro in Manitoba has been an environmental disaster and an assault on tribal sovereignty. We don't need to destroy our environment in order to save it, and we can't. The biodiversity crisis and the climate crisis require us to leave remaining carbon, to leave remaining natural spaces alone, both as habitat and as natural carbon sequestration. In conclusion, please vote yes. How fast we get to net zero is as crucial as the goal itself. That's the time value of carbon. That's why we can't waste time or money on dead end pathways. Knowing the challenges ahead in other sectors should lead us to be racing forward in electricity and transportation where the path is so clear and the benefits are so overwhelming. We'll have other testimony in writing, and thank you, Mr. Chair, for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Mr. Wiginius. Thank you for your testimony. With that, our final in-person testifier is Daniel Del Toro. Mr. Del Toro. And members, we do have some online witnesses as well, which we'll take after the in-person testimony of Mr. Del Toro. Mr. Del Toro, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and present your testimony. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Fritz. Uh, good afternoon, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Daniel Del Toro, and I am the founder of uh, Future Builders Cooperative, an emerging uh, workers cooperative that's preparing new workers to work in Minnesota's clean energy industry. I am here today to speak in favor of Senate File 4, the 100% uh, clean energy bill. We support the bill because the transition to clean energy means jobs. Recently, four of our members uh, were trained as part of the Carpenters Union training uh, program. Since then, we have been working with businesses, developers, uh, doing uh, residential and, co and commercial construction work. This has given us uh, the training and experience we can use to work in other, uh, used to work in other clean energy, energy, energy jobs like home weatherization or solar installation. The 100% energy bill will accelerate our transition to renewable energy, and our members want to be part of that. Uh, this bill will create opportunities for working people like us. 
So I'm here to please ask you to support Senate File uh, 4. Uh, thank you all for, for the opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mr. Del Toro. Members, we're going to take some online testimony now. I believe the pages are set. And if that's, if that's true, I believe our first witness is Stacy Dahl. Ms. Dahl, are you there? Can you hear us? Yes, I can, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and present your testimony. Well, thank you very much, Chairman Prince and members of the committee. I very much appreciate the opportunity to comment on this bill. I'm Stacey Dahl here on behalf of Minkota Power Cooperative, a small not-for-profit G&T co-op that provides power to eight distribution co-ops in Northwest Minnesota. Minkota has many concerns with this bill, chiefly what this means for maintaining stable resources to the grid. It's our mission to provide our member owners the best energy value as we invest in keeping energy affordable and reliable in an environmentally responsible way. We are pushing carbon reduction of our generating assets while providing baseload power to our region during extreme weather and as the grid is under increasing strain. We recognize the need to decarbonize the electric sector. That must be approached with the utmost care and consideration. For years, Minkota has led with one of the most aggressive wind portfolios in the country. We're also undertaking one of the most ambitious carbon capture projects in the world, Project Tundra, to capture and sequester 4 million tons of CO2 annually from our Milton Young station. And that's the equivalent to taking nearly 800,000 fossil fuel vehicles off the road. Minnesota is known as the land of cooperatives, long understanding and trusting co-ops to make self-governance a hallmark of moving our communities forward. This bill, however, erodes governance through a top-down approach. Respectfully, we ask this committee to take additional steps to improve this bill, and we offer our willingness to work together. Specifically, we ask uh, to exempt out-of-state generation. There are substantial legal questions regarding the bill's reach to generating units outside of Minnesota. Um, second, we ask to improve the cooperative governance measures uh, included in this bill. And third, include all technology, and we want to convey our appreciation for the A7 amendments inclusion of additional technologies, um, Mr. Chairman. That's that is helpful, and um, we thank we thank you for your work on that, along with others. Um, so, uh, with that, Mr. Chairman uh, and members of the committee, thank you very much for your time, and um, we look forward to working together. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dahl. Nicely done. Next, the committee will welcome Joyce Peppend from Dairyland. Uh, Ms. Peppen, are you there? I am. Can you hear me okay? Uh, also loud and clear. Thank you. Welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself and um, present your testimony. Thank you, Chairman, friends, and honorable members. My name is Joyce Peppen, and I'm general counsel for Dairyland Power Cooperative. Thank you for the opportunity to testify regarding Senate File 4. Dairyland Power is a GNT electric cooperative located in La Crosse, Wisconsin, that provides wholesale electric power to 24 member distribution cooperatives in 17 municipal utilities in four states, including three electric cooperatives in southeast Minnesota. Dairyland has been purposely diversifying its generating resources, which currently include wind, solar, renewable enabling natural gas, coal, hydro, and biogas. Dairyland is also exploring small modular reactors as nuclear is the only non-carbon emitting resource that can support the integration of renewable resources and ensure a 24 seven power supply. We appreciate the work that has been done on this bill to make it better, but Dairy Lynn still has some concerns and I'd like to highlight a few suggestions for your consideration. One, exempt all out of state generation. There are numerous legal questions raised regarding out of state generation plants and the authority to regulate them across state lines. Last year, the Minnesota Supreme Court ruled that Minnesota state agencies did not have the authority to implement Minnesota regulatory authority on a proposed natural gas plant located in Superior, Wisconsin. Thank you for addressing this issue in an amendment. However, this bill will raise jurisdictional questions via the Federal Powers Act and the limitations of authority beyond a state's border per the Dormant Commerce Clause of the US Constitution. So we propose that all non-Minnesota generation plants be exempted from the carbon standard in this bill. Two, move the 100% carbon-free 
compliance date to 2050 that would align Minnesota with other states and recognize the long-term nature of utility planning for safe, reliable, and cost-effective energy, as well as the time and technology development required to achieve 100% carbon-free. Three, make sure there's sufficient off-ramp authority for cooperative boards, as cooperatives are not-for-profit and are controlled by their members and board of directors. And four, include all carbon reduction resources and technology to meet the 100% objective, which includes lifting the nuclear moratorium to allow small modular nuclear as a future option to meet reliability and carbon-free generation needs. Thank you for your time and your willingness to consider further improvements to the bill. Thank you, Ms. Pepin, and thanks for your engagement on the bill. Looking forward to working with you going forward. Next, Thank we'll you. welcome Mark Roan from Northfield Climate. Mr. Roan, can you hear us? I can. I hope you can hear me. Uh, somewhat. If you could speak up and introduce yourself. Okay. Welcome to the committee, and please present your testimony. Good afternoon, Chair Franz and committee members. I'm Matt Roan from a faith-based rural coalition enthusiastically endorsing Senate File 4, the 100% Clean Energy Bill. I and other Northfielders have pushed for this legislation ever since we experienced several hundred-year floods years ago. This year it was drought damaging our local farmers' crops. Man-made heat-trapping greenhouse gases warm the atmosphere, pull moisture from the earth, and create ever more extreme droughts and storms, as all of us have seen. It's why SF4 serves rural and urban needs. As we push Minnesota to lead, we Northfielders passed our own climate action plan in 2019. It has a 100% carbon-free electricity goal by 2030 that we are on track to achieve. We are a finger in the dike, but our city council acted. Now we need this SF4 action on a bigger scale. Make Minnesota a leading state fighting global warming again, as we briefly became in the early 2000s under a Republican governor and wise bipartisan action. Less ratepayer money will go to the Dakotas, Wyoming, and Canada, and instead to Minnesotans in emerging, equitable, broadly distributed renewable energy jobs that the bill targets. It has excellent safeguards against sudden rate increases or reliability problems. I hope it passes unanimously in this committee and the Senate because of the long overdue good it will produce for humanity, all of God's creation, and Minnesotans everywhere. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rohn. Thank you for your testimony and for taking the time today. The committee would now like to welcome Tame Lloyd from Jefferson. Mr. Lloyd, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? We sure can. Listen, thank you for taking time here. Please introduce yourself and present your testimony. Uh, hi, my name is Tom, and I'm a senior at Jefferson High School here in Bloomington. And I'm also a youth climate advocate at Climate Generation. And uh, here's my testimony. Last summer, I became a monk in Thailand. As a monk, I was taught about the importance of our responses. I was shown how our responses define us and reflect our intentions. With Minnesota facing the worst effects of the climate crisis projected to warm five degrees within my lifetime, we must stop ignoring the climate crisis. We must center our responses on protecting the next generation, my generation, from the floods, heat waves, and droughts we will face. We must tell the next generation that we tried to do something. We recognize the injustices caused by climate change and decided to act decisively against it. We acted to save the lakes, the prairies, the next generation of Minnesotans. As a senior at Jefferson High School here in Bloomington and as a youth intern at Climate Generation, I've seen firsthand how climate change has already challenged the lives of my class. From experiencing floods, water insecurity, and climate anxiety, the effects of climate change are already here and far reaching. This is just the beginning of our climate catastrophe. Passing this bill and becoming carbon neutral is the first step we have to take to save Minnesota. Centering an equitable approach, we must tackle the effects of climate change and the disproportional effects it will have on the most marginalized communities. We must create jobs in green energy and ensure that my generation is protected from the worst effects of climate change. This bill is a big deal. We can create real change here and we can't afford to wait or delay our carbon neutrality. With costs from renewable energy dropping fast, it's time for us to act. For my generation, for my peers, for our earth, please pass this bill. Thank you very much, Mr. Lloyd, and thanks again on behalf of your work. With that, members, we're going to hear from Tyler Hammond from Basin Electric. Mr. Hammond, are you there? 
Yes, sir. Last but not least. I appreciate your time and also your patience. We can hear you. Please identify yourself and present your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Tyler Hammond, testifying on behalf of Basin Electric Power Cooperative. We appreciate the opportunity to submit comment on this legislation. Basin is a not-for-profit generation and transmission cooperative that provides wholesale electric power to 12 electric cooperatives in Minnesota. To serve these cooperatives and over 100 others across nine states, Basin operates a diverse generation portfolio to maintain reliable and affordable electric supply. Basin has implemented a dramatic diversification in our generation portfolio in recent decades that has achieved a 31% reduction in CO2 carbon dioxide intensity, a trend that is forecasted to continue. We continue to evaluate and pursue technological options to achieve further decarbonization. However, it is clear that the state of current and expected carbon-free technology, at least in the short term, is inadequate to maintain reliable electric service on its own. For this reason, we are concerned that this proposed legislation will impact the ability of Basin to serve its members in Minnesota reliably and affordably. And we would like to make the following recommendations to address these impacts. Um, first, I'm gonna, I'll echo my, uh, my colleague Joyce from, from Dairyland. Make clear that this legislation does not apply to out-of-state generation. Basin's power facilities participate in a 14-state power market. The market allows us to buy and sell power most efficiently However, it does not allow us to separate carbon-based and carbon-free electrons that flow into Minnesota. By clarifying that this legislation does not apply to generation outside of the state, the legislature will still achieve its goal of reducing emissions within the state and avoid legal issues associated with interstate commerce. Second, allow all carbon-free technology to qualify. The energy sources currently identified by the bill do not do justice to the suite of technologies being explored to reduce emissions. The legislation should allow and encourage the development of carbon capture technology, small modular nuclear reactors, battery storage, and any other technology that can provide reliable electricity without increasing emissions. So with that, I thank you again for this opportunity to provide feedback, and we look forward to working with, with you and the Minnesota legislature to achieve our mutual goals of reducing emissions while keeping the lights on. Thank you very thank much, you. Mr. Hammond. Thanks for your testimony. Um, Members, we have concluded the list of in-person and online testifiers. Um, are there members of the public who did not get on the list um, who wish to come forward? We have uh, an extra minute or two going once, going twice. All right, thank you very much. Um, to the ranking member, we did say we would save time for questions or comments. We can do that now. Um, we have about another 15 minutes, or we can simply adjourn. Members, again, our intention is to have the bill introduced and amended on Wednesday. Um, any input on whether we want to have questions or comments now? All right, first, Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, I, and I'm glad you and the, you guys are talking about the, the, the process, right? Um, what's, what's nice, I was, um, I was upstairs watching all the testimony that was going on today, and I was just thinking, all right, where do I plug in the questions on the process? Because there's still some, um, still some questions out there just kind of hanging more about the process. You know, I have one about promulgation of rules, how are you going to implement the statute in a timely manner, and maybe that's best saved for Wednesday. I don't know how much time we're going to have to have those conversations, you guys, but um, or do you want to talk about that? Well, now? to Senator, Senator Hoffman, to your question, we have the full uh, agenda available to us on Wednesday, so even if we go for our traditional hour and a half, um, and even if there are a dozen or two amendments, I think we have time to talk about it on Wednesday. I'm more offering members today if you want to uh, get into it, which I guess is a way of saying you can if you want today, Senator Hoffman, or we, we think we have time for it Wednesday. No, no, that's, I think that's where, Mr. Chair, to that point, I think that that makes sense because it's like, you know, have a full robust, because, you know, go back to 2007 if you want me to do a history lesson on CIP in Minnesota, I'll do that. But that, I mean, I think it's to the point we got to have, make sure we're flushing everything out in true traditional, like I heard testimony today on, you know, how Minnesota looks at energy and how we look at getting things done. And so I appreciate you doing that. You're bringing that together. So I'll appreciate that, Mr. Chair. Thank, thank you. you very much, Senator Hoffman. Um, Senator Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, thanks to the testifiers. It's educational. I do think as a committee, though, we should seriously consider uh, the effects of short-term power loss. Uh, you know, one of the largest cities in my district, and I'm from a rural district, had a front uh, page article on, in their newspaper, uh, which I got a copy of here. I won't read it, but they're part of the MISO 
area, it says summer load could mean short-term power loss in the city. Now that city's got about 15,000 people in it. I've never seen that headline before. So we're already at a point where we, the uh, utility com municipal utility company plus the newspaper is reporting a uh, possibility of short-term power loss. So I would just encourage members that to take those comments that have been made seriously and the fact that the technology has not been developed to provide base load electricity on these uh, types of alternatives. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Grunhagen. Uh, Senator, did you want to comment? The question I guess I'm posing is, do you want to take some questions and have some debate now, or do you want to uh, candle it all on Wednesday? Senator Matthews. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, have no doubt, yes, we are planning to have a very robust discussion of this bill uh, on Wednesday. Uh, the only question I'd pose, Mr. Chair, is I know that uh, testifiers are here today. I uh, don't know how many are a planning or able to be back in attendance on Wednesday. Uh, that being said, the last you know 10 minutes or what we have here is not uh, very long to be able to go very in depth. Uh, so uh, I would say uh, to as many as are able uh, that testify today, uh, if you're able to come back uh, on Wednesday, um, that would likely be helpful uh, because you know you had your own two minutes each, and there's so much like we could stop at each two minutes and drill down. Uh, into many of your points. Um, and, uh, you know, this bill still has a lot of work uh, to do, uh, a lot of things to point out, and to hope that the uh, majority is interested in, in working in a bipartisan manner, and we're looking forward to Wednesday. So uh, if there's something pressing, Mr. Chair, I don't know that I have anything uh, super pressing that we can do uh, in the time that we have today. And if some of these uh, testifiers are willing to uh, be back Wednesday. That would probably be helpful. Well, thank you, Senator Matthews. Uh, both Senator Matthews and I made a promise to the public that this committee would be bipartisan and that we would allow for all voices to be heard. So I believe a uh, fair point that if you're able to make it Wednesday, it's very possible a member of the committee would have a question for you. Um, I'm not suggesting that you have to be here, just that Good point by Senator Matthews. It's possible a member would ask for additional testimony. Um, to that point, Senator Matthews, we'll, we'll take it up Wednesday, and members can invite anybody they want back to the witness stand. Senator Mitchell. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I agree to save the debate until Wednesday, but because a point was made, I, I feel it appropriate to immediately make um, another consideration to that, which is if we are talking about power loads, I'm a meteorologist, I've worked in the field for almost 30 years, um, and with our changing climate, although temperatures are overall are going up, it does change the frequency of some of our extreme events. So when we're looking at some of these exceptionally cold snaps, that adds to our power load. When we are looking at a June, like we had two summers ago where we had record 90s before summer had technically even began, and there were so many consecutive days, that adds to our power load. So I think it is tremendously important that we do address these issues because just in terms of the energy we use, by the fact that our climate is changing and we're having more extreme events, that is a big piece of what is adding to that power load. So if we can help get that under control, we will help in addition with our utilities and our energy expenditure. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Mitchell. Members, any other comments? Uh, Senator Lucero. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, I do appreciate the conversation of the those testifiers uh, returning if they're able to, but by the chance that some of the testifiers may not, would you be willing to let me ask a, a question or two? I think we would allow a tiny bit of flexibility here. Um, members, we're going we're to allow Senator Lucero a little uh, grace. Senator Lucero, uh, is uh, two, three minutes enough time for you? It should be. All right. Senator Lucero. I appreciate it, Mr. Chair. And uh, if Ms. Don Wheeler is still in the room. Dr. Wheeler, are you still here? She is. If you 
um, are willing to come forward for a moment or two. Welcome back to the committee, Senator Lucero. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Dr. Wheeler. It is doctor, I presume, right. Dr. Wheeler. Uh, so in your testimony, which I appreciate, you had mentioned heat waves in the last 20 years. I am wondering, in your study, can you give any information around the heat waves much further back when Minnesota was part of an ice age and what heat wave must have took place uh, to warm up at that point? Dr. Wheeler. <laughs> I, I don't think there were any physicians around during the ice age. Um, but but um, you, are you... Are, you're, whether there, there, there are demonstrably, and a meteorologist would be better to be able to speak to this than I am, but there are demonstrably more heat waves um, than, than, um, than, than there were in the, in the past. Um, we have um, probably more baseline um, older people than we did in the, in the distant past, and, and those, are, those, are more, those are the people that are more affected by the heat waves. So I think that the, it's, it's a fact that there are more heat waves, and it's a fact that there's a lot of mortality associated with those heat waves, um, whether it's different than whether the, and I, I suspect that there was some mortality affected with heat waves uh, centuries ago as well. Senator Lucero. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and just one quick follow-up. I appreciate that. Uh, so you had just mentioned in your answer right now that there are more people today that would potentially be impacted by heat Correct. waves. So uh, I've also heard as part of the conversations that because of the people today, the people are the source of, the, of human-caused global climate change. So back to the ice age, do you know approximately how many people and their activity back then would have been the source of the heat wave, which obviously warmed up the earth? Dr. Wheeler. So, so heat waves um, put a, well, how they cause um, death and injury is they put stress on people with underlying diseases if they're in a situation where there, there is a lot of heat. Now, so an outside worker, even if it's a healthy person, is going to be affected by a heat wave, but probably not, not fatally, although sometimes, yes. Um, and, and, uh, but, but people that are of older age, as we have now compared to people during the Ice Age, um, were, would have more underlying disease, um, more heart disease, more, more lung disease, um, just because of why younger people in, in old time, and centuries ago, people died younger from accidents and such like that. Um, so so I, I guess that's my answer to your question. Good enough, Senator Lucero. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I appreciate it. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you uh, so a, a comment then I would have, not a question, sure. uh, in regards to or directed uh, to Mr. Lloyd, who was the, the student from Thomas Jefferson High School. Uh, he was very concerned about the climate crisis and climate catastrophe. And I just, I, my heart goes out to him and to his peers and his entire generation. And so my words to him are, not let your heart be troubled. The climate has been changing the entire history of the world. In some cases, it has changed a little. In some cases, it has changed a lot. And I can understand his perspective because from his vantage point, I highly suspect that much of the information he's receiving, whether it be in the classroom, whether it be in the media, whether it be Hollywood, he's inundated with a perspective which has created this concern within him. So again, let not your heart be troubled. The climate is changing. It always has been changing. And uh, these conversations that we're having in this committee, Mr. Chair, are very valuable for what we in Minnesota and the country should be doing in regards to this ever-changing uh, climate. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Lucero. Unfortunately, for our search for information, Senator Mitchell, a meteorologist, has requested a chance to speak. Senator Mitchell. Thank you, Chair. So I would like to clarify that Minnesota was made a state in 1858. So there was not a Minnesota in the Ice Age. So to ask for data about Minnesota in the Ice Age is to ask about an entity that did not exist at that time. Meteorological records go back into the late 1800s. So we have meteorological records for almost the entire uh, time that Minnesota has been a state. And I can say with absolute clarity, looking at the records, that 
as we have gotten into the last few decades, we have had more extreme weather events, particularly heat events, than any time in Minnesota's history. So we do have a history for Minnesota, going back to our statehood. Uh, I would also like to just add on the doctor's, um, what she said, which is that when we have longer heat events, it has a more cumulative event on, effect on people. Therefore, if there's one day of a heat event, it is less likely to cause someone an injury than if we have a long-term heat event and someone doesn't have air conditioning or a cooling center because the body cannot take that capacity for a longer period of time. Furthermore, if we are going to look back to the ice age, there are core samples that we have been able to take from the ice to show some of these things over time. Since the industrial age, we have been adding more things into the atmosphere that not only accelerate our change, so it is a faster change than we have had previously, which means there is less adaptability of um, not just humans, but animals, migrations, other things that impact us. Um, but in addition to that, we, um, by adding all of the things that are contributing to this faster change into the atmosphere, it does cause the respiratory problems, for example, that some people have said that they have now. So we had a couple hot summers. Because we had hot summers, vegetation dries out. We had exceptional forest fires. You might remember those forest fires for a couple years ago. Going back 20 years, we've uh, calculated the molecules in the atmosphere for respiratory issues. Two summers ago during those forest fires, we had recorded the highest ever in Minnesota, um, some of the action days for respiratory illness because we had the heat exacerbating other situations. So yes, all of these things are a concern. And to the young people out there, I validate your concerns. We do need to act on them and we are going to do that. And I really appreciate your testimony, especially the younger people here today. You did an excellent job. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Mitchell. Uh, members, just for the record, um, Senator Matthews and I will talk before Wednesday, map out a, a you know, rough agenda and how we plan to do it, a time limit perhaps on the entire hearing. And with that, we are adjourned. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.